All right, guys. Welcome to another Leah member interview, hangout, chat, whatever you want to call this. Um, before I introduce our guest slash co-host today, a couple of announcements. Um, we just released uh, the landing page for our 2024 mastermind. So it's landinvestor.co slash mastermind. We've got 275 general admission tickets and then 25 VIP tickets. It's 299 bucks to get into the general mission two day event here in Las Vegas. It's going to be it's going to be awesome. So you can go there. Uh, we'll be releasing the guest speaker list kind of dripped out over the next few weeks, but some really cool names, obviously the usual suspects, Rylan, Michael Bull, uh, Mayor, who is just an absolute killer in this business, Callan Faulkner, some cool people like that. So that's first announcement. Second announcement, uh, my team just released something kind of cool. You guys can go steal our purchase agreement. It's landinvestor.co slash PA. So the same purchase agreement that probably Anthony and I use for our blind offers. It's just a, it's just a one pager that I've been using for, for years. Uh, when I first got into this business, I couldn't find a, a purchase agreement that was suited for marketing. It's like all these like 12 page documents. I'm like, I'm not going to mail that to someone. So and we've kind of put in our favorite terms in there. So you guys can go get that for free. No catches. All right, guys, without further ado, let's introduce our co-host, Anthony Reese. What's up, man? Who are you? Where are you from? And how long have you been in the land business for? So, all right. Uh, from Northern California, a little town called Grass Valley or Auburn. Uh, most people have never heard of it unless you pass it on your way to Tahoe. So um, tiny little town. Um, it's a nice area. I love it, though. But uh, yeah, I've been in the land business now for just over a year. Uh, pretty much sent my first mail March of, of last year and steady, just sending out the mail each month for that entire year. And obviously we're gonna be going into some of the results here in a little bit as well and talking about some of the deals that happened and a number of things. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah it's been like, I yeah, I think there you're, is. You're, you're a cool testament to someone that's, I've just been methodical. I feel like if I could sum you up as a land investor, you've been incredibly methodical. There's been no waste or slack in your system. I think it's cool to see like the effects of that. To give people context though, uh, you weren't a real estate investor before, right? It's not like you're flipping houses and start flipping land. And you do this part-time um, and nights and weekends, I think you bartend as well, right? Yep, yep. Okay. Still doing that. Really? Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Anthony. I was about to say, yeah, about four days a week I'm bartending and then most like it's kind of it's very it fits very nicely with this because especially if we're mailing to the east coast, I'm I'm on the west coast. So most of the calls I get are during the morning. By the time everybody's asleep, I'm I'm doing my other job. So it's like it, it, it balances out great. I feel like when people hear this interview and once we start kind of diving into like the results and the nitty gritty, people are gonna be like, dude, why are you still working that job? So why are you still working that job? Is that for the social aspect? That's part of it too. And then on top of that, so there's a number of reasons. One, this business is lumpy. The, the, the money that comes in, it's very lumpy. Um, I don't need the money from it. Uh, but more importantly, when it comes to like buying a home, getting lending, uh, I do not want to risk losing my two years of history with, with pay, like basically the money coming in from my consistent job. And at the risk of, even though I'm like, I'm honestly getting close to the point where I can just buy something all cash. Like I, but I don't want to, you and I know both know on a leverage uh, someone else's money if possible, but lending on homes is just so, they're just so strict. Like even in the position that I am, it's so difficult and I do not want to risk any potential um, way that that might be affected. And if, and I've had some of my coworkers, they hear like what's going on. They're like, why are you here? <laughs> like, like, what are you doing here? And it's, it's just I, one, I like consistent money and I do like the social aspect of my job. Even if I got to the point where this is really dumping money and I do not need it whatsoever for like a consistent income, I still would probably just like pick up a day or two here and there just cause like it's, it's, I've, I've worked alone before and it's, it eventually gets really disappointing. So I agree, man. I agree. I think that's the, this business can do a lot for you. It doesn't do much in the way of, uh, feeling connected and socializing. And yep. like, I, I think that's part of the reason being in a community is helpful because you can definitely get in this little echo chamber. Um, it's so weird too with the buying houses, man. You could have three times the amount of the home's value in cash and- They don't care. Someone, someone has $40,000 a year from a W2, it's really weird. Yeah, uh, okay, let's, let's dive into some of the granular stuff. So you eclipsed your one year anniversary in land by a couple months. What what's what's happened since then? Let's talk about how many deals you've done, marketing, kinds of deals, things like that. 
So, you know, you know, you always, you always give me crap for it too, how skeptical I was <laughs> when I first started here. So I kind of allotted a small amount of money. Like, I mean, it's still, it's still a good amount of money, but like just relative to what I was, I was like, all right, here's what I have and what I'm willing to lose. Assuming again, in the back of my head, I'm like, worst case scenario, nothing works out. Don't get a single deal. I lose this much money. I learn a ton of stuff. That's worst case scenario. I can deal with that. And so I was like, all right, here's what I have to start with. And which at the time was like, I think I allotted, like I really only needed 15 grand, but I'd say uh, I, I, in my back of my head, I was like ready, ready for 20 to like uh, to put in for the first year. And I think I, I, I ran through my expenses last year. All in was like 17 grand. Um, so yeah, no. And that was like, that was with, writing off some other things like I bought a new laptop and so little things like those couple of little additional expenses and even all with that it was only like 17,000 and um so yeah I spent I sent out 15,000 mailers in the first uh basically 9 months of last year like obviously my basically my package of mailers ran out right like a month before most people kind of stopped mailing anyway so I was like all right I'll just pick up a new package and start hard in the beginning of the new year. And um, so it's 15,000 mailers in total. And I've got one, two, what's it like at least seven deals or six or seven deals from that. So, um, and the first, the first deal I had was in Arkansas and that, that one deal made me profitable um, for the whole year. <laughs> so it's like that one deal put me over, over the mark and recouped all my money. And then, I closed that other one in Washington at the end of the year. And both those, you remember those, those were like package deals. There were first one in Arkansas was two parcels. We sold separately. We purchased together, but sold separately. Second deal just so happened to be another package deal. Uh, three parcels purchased together and then sold separately as well. Even though I think we sold one of the three separate and then sold two together as the second sale, even though we were marketing all three as uh, individual. So I have a quick question for you too, because I think yeah. a lot of people, one, they always want to know how much money should I start with? I'd say like the floor would be 10 grand, 20 grand is perfect. But the truth is like that 17,000 you spent last year, there was also cash flow coming in in between, right? So it's like at a certain point, you're kind of playing with houses money. So how much did you have to spend to get your first deal? I don't know if you actually know that off the top. Of I, I do uh, roughly off the top of my head, probably by the time the first check hit my bank account or the first uh, bank wire came in, I think I was in like 13 grand, 13, but keep in mind, it was like, we, we know the structure of when I bought and with a package deal and the deal funders, they had never really done that before. So we just kind of figured it out as we went and not say that necessarily played out in my favor. Um, so it delayed the, even though we sold the property, it delayed when I actually got paid. And because right. until the second one sold, then I actually collected. So it's probably from my first mailers going out till I think it was March to August. So what is that? Five months, six months. Yeah. 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 Dude, it's interesting. I think I've been saying the wrong number too. I've been saying 14,000 mailers, but it's actually 15,000 mailers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, can't, you can't buy 14,000. You have to, it has to be 15. So it was 15. Okay, cool. 15,000 mailers, seven deals. You're kind of right in that 2000 mailer per deal kind of territory that we talked about. But I think the interesting thing is to get those 15,000 mailers out, you probably downloaded a lot more data. People are like, what, 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 do I, what do I mean by that? One of the things that you've done really exceptionally well is you just have scrubbed the heck out of your data to find the stuff that you actually want to market to and removing the stuff that you don't. So yep. to get 15,000 mailers, how many pieces of data do you think you actually downloaded to get there? So I didn't, uh, obviously I can scrub in data tree without exporting the stuff I don't want. So oh, I scrub and only export the goods, um, double that at least. Yeah. Double that at least on record. So I'm right now my scrubbing is averaging uh, about fifty percent yield. So I'm taking up half of the data essentially when I um, when I go to scrub. It can be anywhere from about a forty to sixty percent yield on average. I've had really bad ones uh, where I may be pulling twenty five or thirty percent of the actual data out, and whether that be it's for a number of reasons. Sometimes data in certain states is just garbage or a bunch of stuff is owned by a land conference conservation, you never know. Um, it's, it could be a number of factors, but I would say about double that in order to, and uh, take in mind the first about three to 5,000 mailers I sent out, I did not scrub. That's what made me realize I needed to scrub was I was getting landlocked garbage properties coming through. And those were most of my calls. And it made me honestly dread picking up the phone. Like when, yeah. when a call came in, I was like, oh, all right, yeah, what's this going to be? You know, like, uh, it's like, 
And then once I started scrubbing up, I got excited to pick up the phone because I know nine times out of 10, it's a, it's a quality property and we're either going to, I'm either going to get told to take off the mailing list or we're going to have a really good conversation about a good property. And that's yeah. like pretty much my two alternatives. So I it never, and now I'm like actually a little bit excited every time the phone rings. So, <laughs> and I don't have an answering service. I just field everything directly to my phone. So through follow up boss and it's, so it's definitely, it, it made me a lot more, it made the whole thing a lot more enjoyable, less, um, less difficult too. Cause in, if you think about the time suck that comes from still picking up those phone, those phone calls for a garbage property and explaining to a seller why actually I don't want to buy this at all. And like this, this, this letter is essentially like, we can't, we can't purchase your property. Sorry. And having those conversations still that drags on sometimes. So to eliminate them entirely or almost entirely, I'll still get, I remember like when I sent my first mailer to Idaho, I was like, that was like one of the first ones I scrubbed really, really hard. And then the first call back was the one landlocked property I missed. <laughs> it's like, I was like, ah, oh, darn. So but the rest were great. So, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. We just, so for land insights V2, we, we built out a feature that does the landlock scrubbing and we've been trying to explain it to people like, cause not everyone's aware that I think it's a valuable thing to do. Yeah. We've got new modules going to Leah this month to show you how to do it manually through like data tree and land vision or how to use land, uh, land insights to scrub it. And like everyone thinks about like just the dollars and cents, which is, well, I save this much on data if I'm using data tree or I save this much on marketing costs. And that's cool. Or I save this much on Pat Live. I think the real thing that I've seen though, whether it's you taking the calls or your team, it's like the fatigue of talking to shitty yeah. leads is real. I don't care who you are. You start to resent this thing after a while. Yep. And the truth is the worst leads, <clears throat> the worst leads always call first. Yep. And they, they, they're the most forward and proactive when they got the junk property and they got the great offer. So it's pretty interesting. You're trimming it by about half. We usually see about, I would say 30% of our data gets scrubbed out. So it leads me to, to ask, okay, you're not just scrubbing landlocked. You're probably scrubbing a little more beyond this. Let's talk about the kind yes. of scrubbing requirements. So um, we can actually, like, kind of, if we if we got enough time to, I can maybe even go through and show one. But um, I'll take out, like, obviously, certain odd-shaped properties. Um, I'll, t I'll definitely take those out. Uh, sometimes, depends on what the comps show. Because sometimes in the East Coast, those properties still sell. And they still sell pretty close to what a normal property would sell for. So it really depends on like what I'm looking through and doing comps and trying to figure out pricing. Like I'm also paying attention to the back of my head. Like, all right, a weird shape property that I would otherwise have scrubbed out actually sold at a pretty good price. Cause yeah. I swear like on the East coast, when they were surveying land, they just scribbled lines wherever they wanted to. Like it said, they didn't care how they really broke things up. It was just, and now obviously more on the West coast, there's more engineered subdivisions, more thought out surveying and uh, property lines. So, if I see weird properties like in specifically mostly like east uh, eastern states, and I notice they're still selling, like that's not a problem. Then, like, there it's like if that is something that people still want for a good price, then so be it. It stays in in the uh, the data set. Um, I also scrub out uh, typically neighbor properties, even though I know I might be losing some deals from this. Um, typically, like if you notice, like there's a house and the guy owns two parcels and you're getting a hit for the empty parcel that's technically his backyard like what's the likelihood that they're going to sell that to us relatively low it's not impossible but it's relatively low um most people unless they're in a financially tough position they're not going to sell you their backyard you know it's like it's it's relatively uh it's in, in i think about it from our perspective as well like if you have a spare empty parcel next to you do you want someone to build next to you? Probably not. You don't want, like, you want that privacy. Stay away, kind of. So, again, there's just multiple factors that probably lean more towards the fact that it, they won't sell to you, even though that it does happen. I've had one lead come in that they actually did want to sell uh, their neighboring parcel, and they were in a tough, like, kind of a tough financial position. They were just trying to liquidate it to shore up their finances. And uh, so it, it, I know I'm probably losing a deal here and there from that. Um, another thing I'll scrub out is, like, say like a big property and I notice it has a flood zone. It's like not too big of a deal, especially like certain hunting properties or whatever it may be. Like a flood zone is not a problem on one of those, but where it's located might be. Now you see a road and then it's a flood zone and then it's most of the property. Well, that means there's probably a creek in between the road and a majority of the property that would maybe require a bridge, something along those lines. I think about a lot of different things like as I'm going through and scrubbing, like I look at that and this is something I feel like it would be hard to teach a VA to understand that when it actually comes to, if we got that property in as a lead and then we see that like, well, not much we can do with that. Cause I mean, it's literally, it's essentially landlocked unless you build some sort of a structure to access a majority of the land. 
I'll pull something like that out. Um, number of things, topography, because typically, like, even though it's a 2D map, the best telltale sign that I've seen without actually viewing a 3D map is squiggly roads, like roads that curve a lot. It's, it's okay, when it's flat land, the path of least resistance is a straight line. So they'll carve a straight road. If they have to draw some crazy road, that means it's really rough topography and that's their only option is to carve a road like that. It's really less efficient. So they had to carve a road like that. So that's something I'll kind of keep in the back of my head. If I see something like really ridiculous, I'm like, that's that's the side of a cliff probably. <laughs> and um, little things like that. There's just so many nuances that have come from me just looking at a bunch of different land comps, areas that I keep in the back of my head as I'm scrubbing to pull out uh, a good chunk of stuff that probably would otherwise, and I take in mind, I, there are probably deals I'm losing because of that. Um, but at the same time, like, if do I really want that cliff side? Really? Do I? You know? <laughs> like, so uh, I, I prefer not to deal with those, even though if you got them at the right price, we all know it's still a deal. It can We can make it work, but it's just the headache of trying to sell that would just not something I really want to deal with. So yeah i feel that yeah there's i mean there's so many situations where you can make money in this business but it's like the hurdles of selling this crummy shaped property on the side of a cliff takes you six months it's, i just don't think it's worth it in a lot of cases yeah i think yeah. the interesting thing too is as you start to look at more 2d maps do i can i can tell topography from a 2d map like pretty damn well even the yeah. red one's actually a cool tip i never even thought of that I can't always tell if it's sloped down or up or what, but I can tell there's some funkiness going on and you can start to read the maps pretty well. I do think though you can train a VA to do this. I think it's really freaking hard. And I think most people, if you've never trained someone before, like it's a tall order to just the first person you hire to make them a killer out of the gate. But I always think like, if you can learn it, if I can learn it, like someone else can learn it. And it is just pattern recognition. Like initially yep. what we did, we just built out this big sheet that had all the patterns to look out for. And then, you know, they, they still weren't perfect. Um, they have pretty much the same hit rate that we're seeing on land insights right now. So like there's still slippage even with a VA, but right now on land insights, we're just doing landlock. We're adding flood zone wetlands where you can kind of put in like the parameters. Hey, if it's more than 50%, take it out. Uh, same thing with odd shape, things like that topography. Um, we're even one of the things we're working on too, which is, which is pretty crazy is like, if you wanted to parcel out properties that are in waterfront we can pull that out for you and have that in a separate sheet so like that way we, we like we could we know what happens with waterfront property so you can kind of segment all that stuff out. um to the million dollar question everyone's going to ask is hey anthony why don't you hire this out or are you going to hire this out and then how long does it take you let's say a thousand records how long does that take you because i know you're so, that's a great question yes i do want to eventually hire this out and that's one thing i've kind of been looking into and thinking about i'm not quite there yet but i'm getting there um and even if I can get a VA to do 80% of the quality that I scrub at, still that's great, you know. Um, so I'm not looking then to mat. I'm not looking to duplicate myself. That's probably unrealistic. And if it, eventually maybe I can get a VA to even 90% of what I do, um, with through time and through them understanding my, the thought process. But I don't expect that right away whatsoever. Um, Yes, I want to hire it out. I'm just, I think more towards the end of this year is more likely when that will happen. And this is, I feel like, and this is something I want to ask you about too. Uh, I feel like this would almost be one of the better things for me to hire out right away. Cause I'm good on the phones. Uh, I don't mind being on the phones. And this just seems to be one of my major time sucks in the business is just literally just scrubbing. And how long it takes me is about right now on a, in a good area without funky issues, whatever it may be. I would say about a thousand records an hour. Um, I, I, I would say nine hundred to a thousand is pretty good for me. I, I, I've timed it a couple times just out of curiosity. Um, I'd say as low as six or seven hundred an hour, um, uh, depending. Again, depends on the area because I, I remember I was like through there's certain like northeast states that uh, were just gar just garbage uh, data and issues with the county records that made pins drop in certain areas like. I remember one pin, like I call it pin stacking is the best way to describe it, where one pin drops on a property, but it represents 43 separate ownership records for some reason. I don't know why that happens. I'm trying to figure that out, but I think it's just an issue with the county records. And my hunch is that on data tree, like you have all your parcel maps and some of them, if you click on it, it says no parcel information, yeah. but that data will be routed to one pin in that town because it shows up as that address. Like it just shows up as an address in this town. So it just routes to the, and that's why I think multiple records are being stacked on a one pin. So that 
that made it just brutal in that state to, to go through and sort out like, all right, there's 43 records I need to pull out. Cause even if I got that as a lead, which I know I didn't get all of them, if I got it as a lead. I can't map the property. I don't even know where it is. So unless they have a survey, some sort of documentation to show where the property is, I can't find it. So yeah. um, it's that, things like that. But if, with all that aside, I would say about 900 to a thousand records per hour and take in mind, it didn't start that way. No. I've gotten better at this. I've gotten faster. Yeah. yeah. Well, we see for a uh, standard VA is three to four hours per thousand records. So that's lightning quick. I don't even think it's humanly possible to get much quicker than that, honestly. On the note of the mapping though, this is, uh, this would be interesting for everyone here. There's, I don't, I can't pinpoint why it's happening exactly in this situation, but what I've seen that can cause it one, sometimes counties just don't map like, like fill in the blank right. county in West Texas. Like, even their GIS maps just don't work. It's just like, it's so yeah. ugly goop. You need someone to get like a legal description and reverse it, or if they have a survey, even a survey can be tough because like, like you don't have that bird's eye view of where the heck the thing actually is. So you're like reverse engineering the street names and stuff like that. Um, sometimes too, it's undivided interests. So there's like kind of fractional ownership. So it's like 40 people have undivided interests and it just stacks it all on top of the property. Um, and then sometimes data tree just sucks. So that's actually yeah. one of the things I've found is data tree is great for data. It's like a nine out of 10 on mapping. I don't know if, have you ever used land ID? Yes, I have used land ID and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. I love it. It's better. Yeah. I mean, the mapping is better. They have more overlays and filters and the mapping is more accurate. So when I can't find a property on mm -hmm. data tree, I can almost always find it on land ID. So I just find Good the enough. mapping. Just like, yeah. It's not perfect on there. Um, I found land vision is better too on some of the mapping. The user interface sucks, but it's a little easier to do it there. Um, okay. People are probably like, dude, this sounds like a lot of effing work. Anthony, why are you doing all this? Let's talk about what was the outcome of scrubbing to this this extent. So um, I actually ran back through my numbers. This is something we'll touch back down on in a little bit. Um, last year, 15,000 mailers, I was running about a 0.55% response rate. Um, almost, and take in mind when I first started, I would just like, if someone told me to take them off the mailing list, I would just delete delete them. <laughs> so there's probably... So I factored in probably a few more responses that I just deleted and it came out closer to 0.6 response rate um, and ended up closing some, some solid deals from it as well. So I would say um, assuming everything sells that I have, which not, we're probably like 70% of the way there, um, assuming everything sells the way I hope it to and uh, or the data says it should, um, probably going to make about 220,000 off of an initial $8,000 investment in mail. <laughs> so, um, okay. that's kind of ridiculous. Okay. It's kind of ridiculous. So, um, even if it, even if we get 80% of that 220, which I, I, it would still going to be put me at like over 20 X return on a, on a, like a, on the mailing cost. So it's kind of, it's ridiculous, honestly, like how yeah. much the actual yield came of that. And, um, so, I mean, you, you really can't go wrong. It's like, again, my whole, my whole thesis when I first started was like, here's my, here's my allotment. I have about 20,000 to play with, make this the most efficient, best use possible. And like, I, I, I have data tree and follow up boss. Yeah. That's it. Like, yeah. I don't, I have none of, I do not have many more bells and whistles aside from that. I do not. I, again, if it was not directly putting money into my pocket, I was not concerned with it. I have time. Time is what I'm willing to give up right now. And in, in, in most of these tools, as you know, they make things more efficient and it saves you time. But if you have time, probably not best idea to spend there. And I'll probably take one from like Mark Cuban's uh, um, thesis. He's like, when you start a business and you and you have money to start with, you got to prioritize not spending money. <laughs> it's like, that's one of the main priorities. And that was... Again, from past experiences, I knew like when I come into this, I'm going to make it as efficient as possible and start there at least and get it, get the, the business through startup phase into survival and then move into thriving. And yeah. that's kind of the whole approach that I took. So that's mostly why I did this was to maximize its efficiency. And I found it interesting too, because like when I first shared my KPIs, I didn't think much of it. Like I kind of like just shared them and everyone's like, wait, what is he doing? <laughs> and I was like... Like everyone was like, that's like, I think Jerry was the first one to point it out. And I was like, he was like, what, like, what are you doing? And then I was like, I, I mean, I didn't realize, I knew it was like, I knew I was doing all right and doing good, but it's like, everyone was like, hold on, what's going on here? And uh, so 
and I find it interesting, the correlation that my letters per deal was almost half of what everyone else was. Um, cause most people were running in the three to 4,000 range and I was at like 2,500 and that's still with, I just started out, there's deals I lost cause I didn't know how to handle them. Like that is for sure the case. And considering that I find it interesting that I take out almost half my data and you know, the correlating factor there is pretty obvious. So the scrubbing really seems to make it way more efficient. Can you scale this efficiency? Yes, I do think that. Will it maintain the same numbers going up? I don't think so. I think it will lose a slight efficiency as you try and scale this up. And you'll start to see it deviate a little bit closer to that uh, three to 4,000 mark on the letters per deal. So um a couple of things to unpack there dude it's all it, these are good points and for context people are like be like what are you talking about we're talking about romance right if one dollar goes into marketing what do you get on the other side for newer land investors like in their first year and leah we, we talk about 10x 12x is pretty fair so for someone to get the numbers anthony's talking about like forty thousand man dollars would be kind of the expectation so you can see why it's you know, those stats are crazy i actually think that your numbers could have gotten lower in terms of the letters per deal because you just said you're just new, right? And so like yep. the folks that are at three to four thousand deals, three to four thousand letters per deal, like their their numbers will actually get better over time as they get better at acquisitions. I think it'd be the same for you. I think you could get as low as eighteen hundred or two thousand. I'm sure there's three, four, five deals that got missed last year. Either because you just didn't recognize the opportunity or you know, weren't following up or what what have you. Um it was mostly a, I, oh go ahead. No, you're I was about to say it's mostly from what I can tell, like, remember how I, I kind of came to you about like August, I was like, dude, everyone's locking up double closes. I haven't like everyone, everyone, like no one's taking it from me. And then you said, my hunch is you got to, you got to talk less and just let the contract do the speaking. Did that. I have not lost one since like, everyone I shoot for, I, I wrap it up and yeah. it's just been night and day difference. So I know for a fact, there's at least three deals that I probably lost that I could have turned into something that I didn't. And, yeah. um, I feel like my follow-up is pretty good uh, and I, I know how to like recognize something that's worth following up on and I will keep like punching it until uh, something happens. But um, no, there's for sure deals that were lost. I know for a fact and I, I've actually followed up to see what they sold for and I was like, I could have made something out of that. And uh, so it, it is what it is, but that's, yeah, nonetheless, but. Well, the deals aren't gone either too, right? It's not, it's not like it's a, uh you only get one chance so there's still probably value in your crm that you could unlock it just not represented in these numbers here today i mean how many leads do you have in your crm dozens or maybe low hundreds uh just under 100 from those okay yeah there's probably a slew of deals sitting in there but what we found so it's been interesting kind of having like this micro experiment with leah members versus leah members with land insights and what the difference is there so like there's the core tenants that we have to do. Okay. Like we've got to market our properties correctly. We've got to have a good acquisition process. Like, let's assume we're doing all those things. Correct. The three variables that I'm really fascinated by now is like, okay, how can we go and get more yield from our marketing by wasting less data? How can we get better deals by working in the right markets and how can we get our days on market down? So, or like that, that comparison there, we've seen folks that make the transition that go from like, we had Tom, for example, I think he was at on average of like 70 days on market. And came down to 14 days 14 or 17 is his new average along those lines and then same thing without the scrubbing folks that are picking better markets were at a 10x and now they're at a 15x and when you stack scrubbing on top of it, the numbers get pretty bonkers i yeah. always like finding the things i think you've done a good job of this i like finding the things i mean minus scrubbing it does take more work but i like finding the things where you get visibility on data and with that data you have way more output with the same input right so i would imagine yeah. you've been scrubbing i imagine you're doing all the right things on the phone but I also imagine you're pretty selective with the markets you work in. I think those are the three big yeah. things that, that kind of shift our results. So let's talk about your market selection. And again, you're doing this all manual, right? Like this is like yeah. hand to hand combat. One thing I will say to you on the, on the note of like, you got time or money and it's totally true. And I do think you can start this business with not much money. Like I'm living proof of that. Like it's definitely possible, but it takes a fuck ton of time. I do think though, as your business starts spitting out cash flow, that's in your best interest to invest in the right area. So for you, I, if I were you, I would invest in Pat Live or something like that. And I would definitely mm -hmm. start working on getting a scrubber to help you. And I think yeah. you, you would just dominate with that. Um, and I think the hiring advice is always slightly different for every person. We kind of have a format, but it does change. I don't. I think for the time that you have to put towards this business and you're good on the phones, it sounds like you enjoy it. It's probably one of the last things that you'll delegate. 
Uh, but let's talk yeah. about your market cycle process. So you're scrubbing the heck out of it. You definitely, I know you work through your leads. I don't think you really let anything slip through the cracks in terms of being attentive to all your leads, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. If someone, someone wants to talk on the phone for an hour, do you let them? Do you, do you have those yeah. hour long time? Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I think and, that's just kind of like the, the takeaway is like you're methodical with every part of this business. There's like not much slack in your system and the results you know, speak to that. Let's talk about your market selection process. What are, what are you doing there? So I typically, I mean, I'm, I, for, I mean, for the longest time, I'm just uh, going through and literally I'll tear it. I'll, I'll just pick a state and tear it up and just like go through every single county, sell through rates, all of it and kind of decide and see what the correlating factor is. One thing I've noticed when it comes to good sell through rates, they're almost always between 30 minutes and an hour outside of a major metro. Yep. Some of the best sell through rates. When you're in the main, in the heart of a major metro, you get too much infill, too much activity. It, it skews the data down. And then you get too far out, there's not enough activity. There's this sweet belt around uh, most, um, most major metropolitan areas that correlates to good sell through rates most of the time. Obviously, you'll find those rural markets that are just on fire for whatever reason. Um, in the East Coast, there's some like that are like hunting lands that are just like those things are gone the second you get them. They, people eat them up like you wouldn't believe. And it blows my mind, too, that what people are willing to pay for hunting land. But it's like it must be like some sort of like religion out there almost like people love their hunting. So um, you just never know uh, in that regards. But like the data will steer you typically in the right directions. And. I pick, I try to pick super hot counties, but what I've noticed is more recently that I feel like I've been going for too hot of counties sometimes, like, uh, and it's just harder to get those deals within them. And it just, there's so many different factors when it comes to market selection and knowing like Idaho is another good example. One thing I've seen is Idaho is just so hard to get deals in for me. Um, it is difficult. Not only is like, I mean, there's plenty of activity up there. I mean, one thing, okay, here's one of the main things I've seen in that area is Idaho has very low property taxes. They have very low taxes in general. And therefore they are hiking up um, tax values to basically peak or above market um, in order to collect enough, enough tax revenue to fund the state. And therefore when you send out a mailer for a property that's $200,000 and you offer them even 110 or something like that, they're like, well, the county told me it's worth 200. And it is actually worth 200. Maybe if we brought it to market, it goes for 190. Yeah. The problem is their county is telling everybody exactly what it's worth in its peak market values because they want to collect tax revenue. So stuff like that, that's what we'll like adjust. So I know in the back of my head, like if I'm mailing Idaho, I'm like, not only am I from California and they just hate us, most states hate us. Um, on top of that, I just know that they're like that's an issue we're going to be running into is just tax values in general. So just each market has its own nuances that make it like either for or in uh, or for or against your benefit. And that's like an example of one of them where I know there's some good counties there, but it's just like so hard to. I've gotten some of the most polarizing results from from Idaho, and we ended up getting that deal there. Um, and overall, like one thing I've noticed too is just across the board, this isn't just in Idaho, but just across the board, Idaho, I've noticed that specifically where that property that we got is, is supplies shooting up. Um, people are still trying to capitalize now uh, on property values that once were, and they're feeling like they're trying to catch that wave. And also the economy is tightening up a little bit. And therefore one of the first things someone wants to liquidate is a useless piece, a piece of land they don't use, not useless because it has a use to somebody, but, um, it's, it's a good way for someone to shore up some finances on something that's just sitting there essentially. So uh, specifically in the area that our, that property we have, and I've noticed supply shot up and over the course of owning it, like uh, that we've, that we've been holding that and we're fighting that right now too. And I don't know if you saw my email about that. We'll get into that some other time, but um, okay. yeah, overall, overall, these are some things that I've been seeing in Texas is another great example. And I think even Clint Turner spoke to this in one of his videos I was watching that They've been tracking supply and it's just whew, off a ramp right now. Supplies coming up and there's not to say it's like a bad area still, like there's still good activity. Supplies is coming up and we're fighting it in certain areas. So that's why obviously, as you know, with, I mean, land insights, you guys do this too, where you're constantly updating the data because these things are shifting. And as we speak, they're shifting. So, but right now I'm still, this is something. So market selection, I, Mostly, I mean, again, do it all manually and still dive into it. Just 
the da- the raw data and I'm now trying to kind of shift away. If I see something with crazy sell through rates, um, depends on the supply. And obviously like if, if you see something with seven active listings and 70 have sold in the last year, like that's a crazy hot County. And I saw a few of those in Georgia, like, um, and I mailed them this crickets, like nothing. I got, I got one to possibly a double close lead and it looks like, it's got wetlands on the back and I'm trying to make something of it, but it's like, it's just super difficult in some of those areas that are extremely, extremely hot. And I'm almost now kind of tapering it down. Like if I see that it is too hot, maybe look surrounding it and try and find something close by. So, um, as a question for you, so that's kind of like my, my market selection process right now is just, again, I'm still working with it, trying to figure that out. Um, one thing I have still an issue with, which makes me go to a bunch of different markets, is just the enough getting enough data in the first place to begin with. And this has kind of just been an issue for me. And I just I don't know what it is. I don't know. I mean, obviously I scrub my data a lot. So for every thousand records I pull, it's kind of equivalent to two. Um, but at the same time, like I'll go into a county and I'll pull the whole county from like say five acres up to 50 and I'll get like a thousand or 1200 records to start and they'll scrub that down to 600 and that's all I got for the county, you know, like, yeah. and that's one issue that I've been having, which makes me just scatter all over the plaque. I, I am sending mail to any and every state that you could probably think of that has any remotely good counties in it and good sell through rates. So I don't, I don't know exactly what the issue is. I feel like yield for data on other people's i don't know if they're if they're having similar issues or what it is so i don't know if that's something we could speak to but yeah we could definitely speak to it um first thing the first thing that i want to say before we talk, touch on that is like so when sell through rates are important we talk about them a lot but there is something to be said about markets that are too hot and i actually tend to avoid those i go after what we call like micropolitan it's actually like a real like wikipedia term and it's like these small rural towns that just pack a really big punch. So you're talking about 30 minutes outside of a major city. And those do have the most demand, I mean, for rural land or, or rural infill. But it's just so hard to get deals there. So I like yeah. the stuff that's like really off the beaten path, but still has the metrics we want. Now, it might not be the hottest thing in that state, but it's usually kind of in the top five or top 10 in that state. Um, and I also make, I try to make relative comparisons within the state. So I'm not just like hunting the hottest one in all of the U.S. because it, it, it can be so wishy-washy. Um, the other thing that I want to say, too, is that like the markets that were really hot, whatever, a year, two, three years ago, they're not so hot anymore. That's something what Clint was talking about at our event with actually Hill County, Texas. And we had done a deal there and, and he did as well. And it's like I forget what the numbers were. I think supplies up by 300 percent or something crazy. Yeah. Like that, right. Yeah. And that's the problem is that like people don't put enough thought into market selection. So it's like. It's worked for me in the past. I'm going to keep on marketing to it or they play as follow the leader game. It's like, well, other investors are working there, so it's good enough for me. And these things are fluid, dude. They change. And I think that's why like, we've moved from updating the land insights data every four weeks to, to now moving it over to two weeks because it really does change. And I think we're kind of at an interesting inflection point right now. Yeah. Um, and that's the, that's the tough thing too is that like what I always struggled with in the past is like I had these these biases in terms of where I was looking. So I got really boxed in. And now that I'm looking at, like I'm zoomed out, I'm looking at every zip code or every uh, state and every county in the US, I'm finding places that I just would have never have looked. I never was gonna look in Merrimack County, New Hampshire, cause it just never was on my radar to even start breaking that down. And so I just find too that way, I used to go in these loops where I would just like hunt for counties and I just end up in the same places every time. Cause I just was so boxed into where I was even looking to start with. Now the issue with data, I mean, this is a common issue that everyone talks about. I think the first thing that we have to recognize is you're getting a 0.6% response rate on your, on your mail, which is which is good by mail standards. But that doesn't mean that that data is combed over. And so eventually to extract more yield, you actually just need to be omnipresent, hit them from other channels. Cause there's only so many good markets we wanna work in right now. And there's only so much scrubbing that we can do. Like I don't wanna blast everyone. So at a certain point, it's like hitting them from other channels to get the most amount out of the data that you're actually that you using. So you can start texting and get maybe a 15 to 20% response rate. Then you can start uh, cold calling and maybe get like a 5% response, you know, on and on and on again. And that's kind of like what we're running into too, because it's like, if I wanted to send 100,000 mailers, like the only way I could do it, or 100,000 pieces of, of marketing going out every month, the only way I could do it by stacking up channels. 
Um, the other thing that I find that a lot of people do, which I really don't know why, I think it's because we talk about the different subtypes of land and people take them as gospel. If you're doing five to 50 acres, you should be doing five to 5,000 acres. Why not? Right? Like, I think that the it's okay to have a floor and that makes sense because it is so different quarter acres versus five acres, but a 50 acre is no different than a, than a 500 acre, honestly, like yeah. the exit strategy, it might be different in the conversations and price points, but it's the same kind of deal. And so I see a lot of folks that run out of data because they put these hard ceilings. And I think we should just remove those. ceilings. If, if you're doing okay. real recreational stuff, just, just do everything. Now, are you going to get a lot of 500 acre deals? No, you're not, but you will get them every now and again, but what you will get are 70, 80, 90, hundred acre deals. And those, those can be pretty sizable. And that also opens up the, possibility of subdividing. I mean, you can subdivide smaller stuff, but it becomes a little yeah. easier on the bigger stuff. Um, the the next thing too, so when you're going and pulling data, obviously you're physically scrubbing the records. Are you adding any other filters like length of ownership or out of state, out of county? Um, length of ownership, sometimes, yes. Uh, mostly like how long they've owned it, no. When they bought it, yes. So I'm if someone bought it within the last year or two, um, chances are they paid like ridiculously higher prices that post COVID. Um, I've noticed that anyone before a certain period of time, like I used to get those calls where like, I just bought this property. And, uh, and so you're asking me like, you're, you're offering me half of what it's worth or whatever it may be. And people before about end of 2020, I don't get that nearly as often, almost never. Um, so that's why I kind of target that and back, but usually that will scrape off like five, 10% of the available. Like, you know, it doesn't take off that much. Um, my square footage, I'll do that or uh, like square, like under sub 500 square feet uh, for a structure to hopefully pull out just land. Um, I, I've been trying to remove a lot of my filters that in order to bring these numbers up and what I have available like for, for data, and mostly when it comes to like acreage brackets, that example is like, if I see, I pretty much won't go like below like about a 40 or $60,000 purchase or excuse me, sale price. So if like, I know five acres are going for 60,000 in the area, I kind of like, all right, start at fives, go all the way up till I hit about two to 300 grand in uh, sale price. And I kind of, that's what I base my criteria, whether that is one acre, five acres, a hundred acres. I, I, that's not necessarily my floor, the acreage size. It's just mostly like, where's the price bracket that I'm shooting at and what that correlates to an acreage in that exact area. So, um, so that's mostly like what I use for those criteria. I'm trying to think of what other ones I use. Um, obviously exclude, do not mail. Occasionally, if I notice, uh, there's like a lot of LLCs and a lot of, uh, what's it called, or just corporate owned in a certain area. Like for example, like some areas are owned by like a lot of corporations who are mostly doing minerals and like coal, oil, something where I'm like, all right, there's just so much of it here. I don't want to sit here and scrub through all of this. Uh, I rather just pull it out from the, on the front end and lose whatever couple of uh, LLCs that might consider even selling to me to begin with. Um, so mostly I'll, I'll do it if I just notice the data is just kind of ridiculous. Uh, with how much quantity is stacked in the favor of say mineral rights or whatever it is. So um, I, I, again, every, and these filters are so fluctuating, like, cause they don't always work in the same areas and they don't also make sense in the same areas all the time. Um, and sometimes I'll use like assessed uh, improvement percent and what's it called? Uh, just market total value. Cause obviously like sub $500 or sub a thousand dollars. Sometimes it's, it's typically a marshland, or a church owns it or a cemetery like those those they have the tax they have the tax market values for that reason so i'll use those to hopefully just whittle down what i would have already scrubbed to begin with um so just to hopefully to take off the uh extra work that it takes to go through and scrubbing everything so that's only really I, i've been trying to limit the uh amount of filters I use on data tree for these exact reasons to hopefully bring those numbers up. But still, I just, I, I, I tend to struggle being able to get enough data in a certain area. And like you said, though, building up omnipresence in a certain area that will, I do foresee that being something I need to start focusing on in the future. Like mail cannot just be my only solution. Um, yep. Whether you stack on like texting, calling RVM, you name it. Uh, that like, I feel like, I think I saw a video about Clint talking about that, where he was like, he runs it in a certain order and then we'll mail at the end of whoever didn't respond to all the rest of them, just because obviously mail is one of the most expensive forms of communication with the seller. And 
he was getting like 20 or 30 percent list list penetration like that they actually got people on the call so or got some sort of contact from somebody so it's like 30 percent of a thousand you're getting 300 total responses across multi-channel medias and um and that's, I, I thought that was just awesome when he just went through with like a marketing manager and broke it all down, like how they actually, I was like, whoa, this is, this, this, this opened up a, a door for me right now, just understanding that there's, this is a way more efficient way to approach it, I feel like, when it comes to maximizing the yield from the data that you do have. And I feel like in conjunction with scrubbing, that could be awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, dude, I think that, it, um, you know, what I see is uh, everyone as they grow into this, it's like, how, how do I get the most list penetration and how do I take the data that I'm getting and, and reach as many people or same thing. There's only so many good markets. So how can I get the most deals in the right markets I want to work in? I still think in the beginning, I'm very bullish on people starting with direct mail because it's like so leveraged in a sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think as you start building a team, building out because every other marketing channel pretty much requires someone running it. Um, yep. as they're all full time jobs. But yeah, I think that's the goal for, for most folks is like, Okay, how can we go get? I think I mean yeah, twenty to thirty percent. I think it's pretty achievable. I mean, you could get fifteen percent just through texting or close to it. Um, so I think wow. that is something to work towards. What I will say on the 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 filters. I mean, none of the filters you're using are that extreme. But I think if I were you and I wanted to get more data, the first thing that I would say is why am I married to the fifty to sixty thousand floor? Because the truth is, it's like it's so slanted in terms of where the majority of quantity is for data. It's mainly on the lower end. And if you've got a reliable way to go and make 15, 20, 30 grand on a deal, why not go after them? I think that becomes a little more relevant once you start building a team and it requires less of you and all the parts in this business. You want to be a little more of a sniper in the beginning, but as you start building that team and it's not requiring you for every part of the journey for a deal to get done, you got to kind of open up your parameters and start doing smaller deals. That's what I found. Or you flip flop and you just become the value add monster and you just do huge deals. But that's not relevant for most people at this, at this point in their journey. So I would probably slide that. I mean, would you do a deal that would make you 15 grand? The answer is probably, yeah. Especially if it's in a good yes. market and you know the, the market you got a real table. Huh? The thing is, the thing is I, I marketed so many of those when I first started. Like, yeah. I was always, I, for some reason, just kept getting deals of higher value. And yeah. in the, the few, I remember I, I mailed some some property in Washington and I offered like 21000 It's sell for forty. you know, and... I guess get a call like those those sellers for some reason are just like I don't know what it's like that lower bracket that twenty thousand means so much more to them, you know like for some reason I don't know what it is or whether it was just what I was experiencing but trust me I was mailing those all the time like it wasn't just that I was going after this large stuff I was open to going after large stuff because I knew like if there's a deal that I couldn't get funded this is when again this is when I first started so it's in the back of my head I'm like if there's a deal I couldn't get funded I do have the money to go close it myself. So I wasn't, I was open to hitting larger stuff because it just didn't bother me or it didn't worry me the idea of getting funding. Obviously now, once I've done enough of these, I realize like most deals, I don't even want to do them if I can't get funding because it's just like, if they're seeing something I'm not and they don't want to fund it and put their money behind it, why should I? Like I really, so I, that, that's again, this, so when I first came into it with that mindset, that quickly got eroded away when I realized you don't really want to do a deal you can't borrow on. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I agree. So, uh, whether you actually do or don't, it's I, I always want that availability um, and know that it's a deal that it's worth worthy of funding, should I say? And um, and again, most uh, pretty much everything I have done funding on. And uh, so I don't know something about. I trust me, I mailed probably a solid third of the mail that went out last year was towards lower end properties in that bracket that you just described, and I just didn't get them. Like I just didn't get them, and. When even like the leads that I did have come in, I would hit them with an offer where we could purchase it at, like say it's a thirty thousand dollar property. I'll hit them at like fourteen, thirteen. None of them bit, so it was just, uh, it just yeah. I think, just, yeah. A, I think it's a, I think it's more of like a a sample size fluke, and it was also in yes. the very beginning of your journey, so you've just gotten better on the phone. I, yes, there are some of these low value property owners that the money means more to them. Yeah, but in the same vein. Those same people also, they really need the money typically. So like, I just I get that. more motivation there. The guy that owns a $300,000 property, I mean, he probably got money elsewhere. It's probably not the end of the world if he does, does or doesn't sell his thing. So it cuts both ways. I also find that as a percentage, we can always lock these things up reliably at like 30 to 40% of what they're worth. So it's not like the math isn't always just a double your money situation. Some of those are triple or sometimes even a 4X. 
So even though you might be selling a thirty thousand dollar property, you still might net twenty on that thing. So yeah, I, I would go back to the drawing board there. I think it's more sample size where you just you are new to the game and you're probably a lot more equipped for it now. I mean, fifteen thousand mailers honestly is like it's not enough to be super indicative on something. True, like that. true, even totally. Only, uh, what I will say too, so on the the length of ownership, I mean, this is a sticky wick because if you're starting out and you're like on a super budget, yeah, okay, probably trim those things off because your yield is going to be worse, but it is still profitable, I find. Because what happens to the person that inherited the property in 2023? And they Good actually point. give a hoot about it, you know? So you could do it by vesting status or, or I forget how it is in, in day trade. I think there's a way to look at how it hmm. was conveyed. Like you can kind of whittle it down that way. Maybe just find people that are more relevant based off of how it was conveyed. Um, I think too, like if you could look at transactions, I don't know how you would do this in data tree, but if you could look up like inner family transactions, I think those would be really interesting and then just go after the ones that are recent. But yeah, you might get one deal for 5,000, but it's still profitable. And at a certain point, our yield does go down because there's, you know, if we're, we can't be so sniper-esque. We do have to kind of give up some margin to, to fill it up with volume and it's still profitable. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, you're talking about a, you're talking about maybe ten percent of your record, so it's not much. But if you do go mail fifty thousand mailers this year, like it, it could make a sizable, it could add to your 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 pot. You could add a little bit to your pot. It's the same thing with the out of state, out of county. Yeah, our yield's not as good, but it's still pretty darn good. Um, it sounds like you're breaking down all your markets at a county level. People are going to want to know: Are you just pricing them by acreage? Is it more granular than that? Yes, I do break things down by a county level, but depends. If there's a certain portion of the county that I know is like, all right, I don't know what it is, but this everything's higher over here. Like every, I'll break, I'll break it down by polygons and mail those separately at a different price point because I, I just can see that the price is fluctuating in this certain region. Um, whether it be like a number of factors, proximity to a good neighborhood, uh, you you name it. Uh, for some reason, some areas in the same county are just trading higher, and I I take note of that. Um, yeah. I have been playing with zip codes more. My big issue with zip codes is some of them are so small, there's not enough data to really base my pricing off of from just that zip code. Um, or there's like a gap where you're seeing what fives are selling for and you're seeing what 20s are selling for, but no 10s in the area or something like no no clear answer as to what everything else in between there is is trading at. And I'm kind of like if, if there if in a zip code, if there isn't at least about 15 sold records that are actually usable, um, not just like off market comps, but 15 solid on market records that I can base some sort of sense of pricing off of. I, it just makes it difficult or I'll just like take that, that zip code. I have been playing with zip codes more. I haven't, this is more recent. This is very recent actually within the last couple of mailers. I haven't got to send like, I think I just sent out one of my first mailers, literally just finished the merge proof before we got on this call that will be hitting a zip code. Um, so this is uh, again, and I always have my mail backlogged. So like, I'll pull the data and I'm always have like about a month or two of mail already pre-scheduled, ready to go out. So I just never miss. Um, so right now uh, I am playing with that, but even if I find a zip code where there's not enough data, then I will at least like, all right, I'll be targeting the zip code, but I'll just zoom out just a little bit, open it up and take off the, 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 uh, the area, maybe draw a polygon on Redfin and just of a certain area. Cause like if you go like another couple miles outside of the zip code, it's still going to be, enough, uh, close enough to be a localized area with a similar pricing. So um, I'll, I've been playing with that. We'll see how it goes. No no answer as to yet what's going on with that, but I, I'm, I'm assuming it's gonna yield pretty good results uh, just because of how targeted it is. So I do like that idea and I do want to play with it more. Yeah, yeah, I've been loving the zip codes. I think there's there's that the, the data is more thin and so you have to be willing to kind of roll the dice but if i've got a sandwich situation i'm willing to roll the dice if i know the low and the high and I'll, I'll, I'll make some conclusions for what's in the middle and same here for the most part yeah but you're, yeah. you're usually going to get away just fine uh let's talk about the goals for this year so i imagine you're going to send more than fifteen thousand mailers so what what are the goals both from a marketing standpoint and just where you want to grow the business so the first little chunk of money I did get from last year, I didn't want to pay taxes on it. So I dumped it right back in the mail. <laughs> and um, So I already prepaid uh, and prepaid postage for 30,000 at the end of last year. And I'm going to Mexico at the end of this month, uh, kind of a spur of the moment trip that got dropped in my lap. And my brother and my uncle and uh, grandfather were all going to Mexico. And uh, my, uncle built a, my uncle built a place down there and it's just getting finished. So we're gonna kind of do final walkthrough and, and uh, hang out there and check out the area. And I've just never been out of the country, so it's gonna be fun. But- um, Oh, never been out of the country, huh? That's a big deal. Yeah. 
I got my passport and a plane ticket. Uh, Cabo San Lucas. Okay. Cool, man. Yeah. Do you want to do yeah. any traveling this year? I wonder if he's going to give you the travel bug. Uh, we'll see. Um, I'm I'm kind of a homebody. I don't mind just hanging out. <laughs> like I'm, I'm I doesn't like I do like traveling, but typically I like having something to go do while I'm traveling or some reason. So this is kind of like yeah. the first time I'm just traveling for no good reason other than to 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 tag along. And um, I'm just not one to really do that. I'm not super. I like I like just kind of being in my my little zone and doing my stuff. So it's like not too big of a deal to me yet. I know at some point I'll probably start traveling more. Uh, not super high on my mind, but um, the point being why I brought that up is because like I'm, I got my mail scheduled out, and even up till past that point. But uh, once I get back, then I'm really gonna start trying to ramp things up because I have a deal closing at the end. Like basically, right as I'm getting on the plan, like I should be getting a bank wire for um, a, a deal uh, in Arizona, and that will be a majority, a, a large chunk of change <laughs> from that one. So. Um, that that's once I get that in, then I will feel a lot more comfortable kind of like sending out what the mail that I kind of prepaid. And so it looks like I'll triple my volume this year is most likely the scenario where I send out that full 30,000, buy another 15,000 and send that out. So I, I did my KPIs and my, um, cause I built out that KPI spreadsheet. If you're in the group, feel free to ask me for it. If you didn't see it already, I built out my KPI spreadsheet for the preparation and projection to send out 30,000. So I'm looking to do probably another quarter million this year. And just kind of, and that's like kind of hopefully conservative estimates based off of last year's performance. Um, and so I'm uh, based off that, but that's just with the assumption of I'm going to send out 30,000 records regardless because I have already prepaid that. So now that things are like money will be in the bank account and I can scale it up even more. I'm probably gonna throw out another 15,000 by the end of the year is my guess. So. We'll see. Dude, I'd be shocked if you only did a quarter million of that much mail. I'd be I, 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 I would rather, yeah, I'd rather uh, estimate low, but um, that's that's what I kind of estimate. Yeah. So to, to send out forty-five thousand mailers, are are you going to have to start building a team? Or is that still not on your mind? I can. Oh, sorry, the stock market just closed. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I can. I can do fit. I can do forty-five thousand on my own towards the end of the year. Assuming everything just goes just dandy, I'll probably look towards the end of this year to probably at least get a VA on to help scrub. Because if I just get that off my back, just scrubbing alone, I could probably double, like double or triple my volume even past what I'm doing now. So um, that would be. Uh, I feel like and that's that's interesting. We you brought you talked about that like the order of hiring because yeah. most often it's it's acquisition manager first. I feel like scrubbing would be the best use of like, basic like little tasks like scrubbing um, and gathering data from data tree based off of markets. I point them in uh, the direction of something like that will be probably the best use right now of my time because that seems to be my biggest time suck when it comes to this. So then I feel like after that acquisition manager would be next. Um, but that's kind of like the order of, of things. And I first see that assuming everything goes how I kind of expect it to probably the end of this year is, is like, like more towards like uh, Q4 of this year that I, I would consider probably getting a, a VA on is just based off my hunch right now. So. Okay. So from what you learned last year, what are the areas you're looking to improve on any deficits that you feel like you want to strengthen? Um, huh? So, Yes, uh, most of all, but I feel like I've already kind of shored that up is a little bit is mostly double closing is being able to maximize leads that are not fit for funding, but still plenty of spread there and double close. I'm, I'm trying to like if it's a decent property and there's some spread to be had there, everyone gets an offer and everyone gets two forms of offers if they're not interested in the first one. Um, and that's double closing. So I'm trying to maximize the amount of, which again, at the last year I was trying this, but I, I was new, I wasn't good at it yet. And now like, I, I'm, I'm very good at picking out like, and, and again, I, when I'm doing these double close conversations, like I can sense there's not enough motivation to take the cash price. And typically with that lack of motivation comes uh, more willingness to wait. Because obviously, that if they're not, they don't want it right now. And they're not willing to take the cash price. They're they're okay with holding on to it. And it's like, okay, if you're okay with holding on to it, why don't we just do like this solution? Um, yeah. If you want that much money, give me some time. And that's pretty much the conversation I have. It's very straightforward. Like, and uh, 
it really hasn't missed. <laughs> so it's like every time I pitch it in that direction, I sense it like that. Hey, th this seems like a better solution for you. Uh, they almost always take it. So it's um, it, it, I have not really had a problem. So maximizing that. And then also I do want to do, cause we, we attempt to do the, uh, that subdivide in Idaho. I still do want to do a subdivide. I still do want to do one and uh, land an actual subdivide deal uh, where we take it full course. And uh, I am hoping to see that happen. Um, and also try and maximize those leads that coming in that have that uh, potential to be a subdivide. I would like to make sure I, I, I close one of them at least, at least one. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of like the main area I want to fix. Uh, other than that, it's a bunch of like other little things like trying to make just overall the business a little bit more efficient, more structured. Cause again, I'm doing everything myself. So sometimes I do feel a little bit scattered. Um, I would just like to put something more in place with, uh, whether that be assistance through a VA or just, more cut and dry, uh, I guess procedures and SOPs. Yeah. Best way to yeah. so a little bit order that time man. in due time. I mean, you're you're only a year in, so that that, that stuff you're kind of getting right into the territory where it starts to make sense to really start documenting that stuff and preparing yeah. for bringing someone else in. What what's what's the why? Like, what why are you doing? Why do you want to three extra marketing? So like, what, what what's the motivation behind all this? So. Okay. Fundamentally, when it, the true motivation for me, I'm, I'm a business nerd. I love business. I love finance. Like it is my hobby. It is fun to me. I, um, I, I, I literally, I can, I, if someone, I, I have a friend, a coworker at work and, um, she's marrying into a family that has a winery and the winery is struggling a little bit too. And I told her, I was like, let's sit down. Like once you get access to the books, let's sit down. Like, let's look at these things. A, a fun night to me is looking at the books. <laughs> you know, it's like that's I. It's incredibly boring for most people, and people don't understand it. But this this stuff's enjoyable to me, and yeah. part of just out of curiosity, I want to see what the books look like, like and what it looks like to what run a winery, and then see if we see something. Because me and her both have a hunch that there's money like being spent unnecessarily, and where could you shore it up to get the winery in a better position? And she is very interested in trying to make this a very successful winery, and I, uh, she's a good friend of mine would love to help in that and but that's literally genuinely fun to me is just doing something like that breaking open the books and finding out and dissecting a business and seeing where things could be fixed and it's um it, it's just a joy of mine so i've always i've done multiple things in the past uh when it comes to business and again this is part of the reason i took the approach of coming into this business the way i did from past mistakes or past lessons um to run it extremely efficiently because in the past I've done certain things where I was like, I could have started that with less. I could have uh, approached it differently, whatever it may be to make it more efficient. And that's why I was like this next one, I was like, I'm going to hit this the most efficiently way, efficient way possible. And <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> I am a little bit sick right now. So I'm surprised I sound as good as I do right now uh, to, to basically Essentially, I, I want to, I've always wanted to start businesses and run multiple businesses. Like it's just a joy of mine. Um, I've done it in the past. I, I want to do it again. I want to do it more after this. And I wanted to find a business to take that first things first. Like when I saw this was like, this looks like there's enough meat on the bone to really build a business with, you know, there's enough meat on the bone coming in from the outputs to really cover the stuff in between with comfort and be able to like, oh, really produce based off of what you put into it. So I was like, all right, that's why I like the model. Again, super skeptical when I joined. Um, so I, again, I just like, all right, here's, here's my allotment and here's what I'm willing to start with. And I want to test the business model and then let it feed itself and grow itself relatively organically. Um, and that's exactly kind of what I've been doing though. It's like the money that's coming in will fuel its own growth. It's, it's, it's kind of uh, playing out exactly as I hoped. And ultimately like the, the why is just, I do love business, but um, I mean, I guess uh, that's really it. I'm trying to think of more of a why, but I just love business. <laughs> like, it's like, that's it. Like, I'm trying to think yeah. there's like more, maybe more to it. Like, obviously I want some financial freedom. I want time freedom. I want some of these things too. But like the part of the reason I started this is because like, 
some of the things I've done in the past too, the markets shifted and I stopped doing them for about a year. And let me tell you what, just one year of going to work, coming home, eating food, falling asleep, the monotony and the boringness of it ate me alive, man. Like I was, I cannot begin to explain how like, I literally got depressed. And the second I start, I was like, I need something to fill this extra time with. I'm not good at just hanging out. I'm not good at just like going to do like basic things. I, I was trying that. I was like, literally I'd go paddle boarding with some friends or something like that. And it's like, all right, that's cool. Now what? <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I can't, I can't do this forever. Like I need something to fill this extra time with. And, uh, I would say that's mostly my why It's like, I'm genuinely addicted to business. <laughs> like it's like, there's, I've realized I need it for my own well being and my own, I just need a project. I need something to work on something to be, to feel like that it's not only moving my life forward in the direction that I want to see it, but just something to do. <laughs> and it's like, and cause I'm, I'm, I, I need more. I just need more. So I wish there was a better, more deep why to it, but there's not, <laughs> I don't think there is right now. I'd say, you know, fuck a deep why I'd rather give an honest why. And I, I definitely resonate with that. I mean, I think it's, I'm curious to know why you enjoy business, like what it is about it. I think for me, like I, I'm the same way. I just kind of like it because I like it. And it doesn't mean that there's a lot of hard shit that comes with it. And there definitely are days that oh, yeah. off. Cause like, that's the thing. That's the thing that's interesting is like having this as your hobby, which it genuinely is. Sounds like for both of us, you want to get better at the game, but the stakes get higher and higher and higher. And the problems yeah. get bigger and bigger and bigger. And sometimes I'm like, God, this I enjoy it, but it comes with a lot of problems. And so we're trying to figure <laughs> out how to, how to not just have growing at any cost be the main focus. Cause I think that's where like you really start breaking things. But for me, it's like, it's the, the idea of coming into a situation and having no idea on how to solve it and trying to duct tape together a solution. Like I was, I was on another call yesterday with another Leah member. And the way I think about it is like business feels like I'm in a room with a blindfold on and I'm trying to find the right door. And there's many, many doors and there's mm -hmm. knives on the walls that might stab me if I walk into them. And I'm like, is it this door? No, is it this door? No. And then eventually you find the one that works. Like, oh shit, I made it. And I actually, I think that's really fun, the problem solving. I also like the fact that it's a perpetual game. So it's a game that really yeah. never ends. I mean, once you've got a very clear, finite goal, which I don't, it's just, you, you can't beat the game. So it's just a game that goes yeah. on forever. That's kind of enjoyable. What, what is it about business that you enjoy the most though? A lot of what you just said there, actually, it's not only is it, it's difficult. It is fundamentally difficult. And to play this game, that's hard. It's a very hard game. A lot of people fail at it. A lot of people try it. It's not easy and to succeed and to have any form of success from it and to, to tackle that like head on. And like you said, for the problem solving, uh, there is, when you do get some sort of success from it, there is a few things more rewarding that you took something, you built it from scratch, you made it work and now it feeds you. Now it, it produces and you built this organization, you built a system, you built this project, you, whatever it may be. And that actually produces like more, uh, more money, which ultimately translates to either more time, more well-being, more just oh, whatever that may translate to you in your life to, to go out and do that. It's not just the money that comes from it. It's the fact that I, I, I did something that's very difficult. I get a payoff from it and a reward from it, but it's not just a monetary reward. It's like the knowing that I can do this, the knowing that I could succeed, the knowing like, uh, this like all that combined, there's few things more fulfilling than that feeling. Like I just, I just kicked ass, you know, it's like, and um, I, I will forever chase that. And it's like, I realized too, because it's like literally few things that are more euphoric than that feeling. And it's not money is just a sign that you're kind of like on that right path of that. It's like, not like the end all be all to me. It's more just like, it is just a difficult process too. And the overcoming it, the whole, the hero, whole hero's journey to it, you know? And uh, combined with the fact that you actually get a material reward from it in conjunction with this uh, kind of, I don't know, I want to say spiritual reward, but like it does almost feel like that sensation a little bit. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's a com combination of all things that I've found is just so euphoric and just like fulfilling, genuinely fulfilling. So um, for me to know that, and then also you gain this confidence in yourself to be able to, like you said, those those ridiculous problems come your way and you sort your way through them. You get confident that you're, you can handle life and whatever it has to throw at you and you can keep doing this. And that just overall the confidence, 
the uh, fulfillment that comes from that actual business building is very exciting. It's just, uh, it's, it's really exciting to me. So um, yeah, I'm, so I'm just excited. Totally. <laughs> I think the I think there is a spiritual element. At least I have always thought there's a spiritual element, and the element is like to take something up here and to and to bring it into the real world. I mean, call it manifesting, whatever you want. Like that's a spiritual process. I think I think it's really cool mm -hmm. to turn thoughts into your physical reality. And it's like everything I've ever done started with a thought, and you don't always know the exact outcome. But the catalyst yeah. is always with a thought, which I find really enjoyable. Um, I am looking at the clock. We got a, probably about four or five more minutes here. Got another call coming up. But I, what I always want to do, and what I want to do here is pass off the crystal aka the mic to you and you can grill me with any questions that you have so one thing i want and I, I was talking to a couple other people in the group and someone actually asked me and i didn't think much of it i was like all right we'll see how the numbers play out too right now and i feel like it is might be too you're probably gonna say it might be too small of a sample size right now but right now i'm running about on this new on the on the mailers coming in this new year i'm running at about 0.3 percent response rate so I'm sending out like twice as much mail and getting about the same responses as I was last year. I'm still like everything else that I've been tracking on my KPIs are looking pretty good. I'm yet to actually do a cash close. I got two double closes from it so far and I have one that might be a cash close. Right now it's just moving slower a little bit. And even though it still feels like it's on the right track, it just feels like I was like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna ramp it up and we're gonna see similar results, just multiply. And it yeah. doesn't feel that way. So yeah. uh, I, I'm just kind of curious, like, have you guys been seeing anything else? Uh, any any slowdown uh, when it comes to new deals coming in, when it comes to response rates, when it comes to anything that the KPIs yeah. are, are moving around a little bit? Or what are you guys seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing that I've seen just holistically is that the KPIs always kind of move around. And honestly, like what I tell people is usually a quarter percent to maybe 0.4%. It's kind of like what we really expect for response rate. So whatever yeah. you were at 0.6, like you might not live there forever. It, it definitely is. It weaves and bobs and changes. Um, it's interesting. Every time I'm going through something personal in this business where I'm like, damn, it feels like X, Y, and Z is happening. I ask someone else and they're having like a totally different experience. But actually hmm. on our side, our acquisitions have been... I'd say better than normal, better than at least the start of the year, the last couple of months. So things are trending in the right direction for us. But I mean, I don't know. Maybe there, maybe there is. There's. How, how, let me back up. How, how many mailers have you sent this year? Like, what's the sample? Size? Um, it's going to be about nine thousand right now. Um, okay. and I think that I'm just sending out another two, so we're going to be at either ten or eleven thousand. Uh, but obviously they're about to go out, so that's kind of where I'm so at right now. Nine thousand have hit. Nine thousand have already hit. Yes, but I'd say maybe a thousand or fifteen hundred of that just hit, just hit. Okay, okay. so um, uh, a little too early. Two, I contract, do. two contracts sounds like you might get another. Are there any other warm leads in that pile? There are. One was a total of like fifty-five acres that she kind of wants full mark. I think she wants more than it's even worth in market value. She thinks it's worth like one point four uh, million, and. It's already basically, it's like two 15 acre parcels and three eight acre parcels. And the three eights have highway road frontage and have commercial potential. But right across the street from her is 65 acres up for 1.38 million. That's been on the market for 256 days already. I was like, I'm like, look, look, there, there it is right there. It's right across. And there's also power lines running through one of the 15 acres too. So, and I also talked to, I had, cause I ended up getting the, one of the double closes on five acres right down the road. And that's one of my, it's, it's live right now. And we're actually getting really good traction on it. Um, that one. So I, I do know the area and I'm specifically, I had two realtors tell me like, is it on oil field road? And um, I was like, no, but uh, I do have it differently. And I was like, cause there's something I need to know. And she's like, yeah, it's just not the best place. <laughs> I was like, all right. It's like, it's just not that great. Uh, an Airbnb, it's just values are a little bit lower. And then across the street from her, was 62 acres as one whole lot, like across the highway, it also has highway road frontage, yeah. sold for like 960 or something like that. And I was like, well, there's there's our there's our number right there. And I was thinking, because of the way she wants it, she kind of wanted seller financing because she doesn't want to pay capital gains right off the top, like right on that large of a chunk of change. And I was like, oh, we like, note wrap this thing, like easy right there. I was like, I was like, let's, let's shoot for this direction. I was like, but she just wants such a high price as like, I can't buy it at market value and sell it on a note 
at market value unless you're collecting a difference of uh, down payment or you're collecting a difference uh, or both of percentage that you're charging. So yeah, I, I just, I don't know if she's going to be willing to, I need to call her again too. Cause I just, I just don't think there's enough motivation there. She really wants to avoid taxes. Doesn't need to sell it right away. She did say she wants to help her daughter out. So we'll see, but um, I don't know. There's, there's that one. I feel like it has some potential and I just mailed her on one of the eight acres, I think is what I actually did mail her on. And they, she just wants a lot. Them sold individually, like that's where you can unlock some value for sure. Cause I feel like I ran my numbers and I think it was like all in all, if you sold all of them separately, it's probably like worth 1.5. But as it sits, I wouldn't pay more than 900 for it. And that's market value. But if you can get that on a wrap and then sell it off separately, go through the whole process. But then we have five closing costs. We got realtor fees. You got you, you, all of it combined. I'm like, you, you, it better be a good situation yeah. um, in order to tackle that. So it's a, it's a tough one. But um, uh, I don't know where we're going with that. I saw I got off track. I started going really into that deal. But so the the nine thousand are they all in the same state or are they all in the same market roughly? Oh, um, like at least three or four different states across probably a okay. collection of, but anywhere from four counties up to nine counties. Okay. So let's look at the, whatever the nine counties in there. Are there any that are dragging the average down? Cause like, is it all Georgia. across the board? Georgia is. So Georgia. if you remove the crummy ones, what are the other ones sitting at for a response rate? More kind of good question. API. That's a good question. I can have it right here. Um, is that's the thing is that like, dude, 9,000 mailers is, I mean, hey, this business is just lumpy as is, as you yep. know. But also, like mailer to mailer, county to county, I mean, it can really range so much. So I see sometimes people that throw out the baby with the bathwater, and they sent nine counties and three absolutely flop, which happens, and the other yeah. whatever it looks like actually kind of within KPI. But dude, the, the, honestly, I don't really give a hoot about response rate. I see that it ranges wildly from market to market and campaign yep. to campaign with timing. I just want to know if I spend this much money on marketing, like how much do I make? And as long as you can sure. make. 20 you know, point one, you know, point zero one percent response rate or something like that. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's anything in particular happening. I mean, maybe the election, maybe there's some uncertainty out there. If I had to try to peg it at something, but from what I'm saying, the land business is, I think it's kind of turned a corner on the disposition side. Like dispositions seem really strong, acquisitions seem normal. They're not like greater or worse than what I've seen. Um, so yeah, hard to hard to attribute to something, but I think it's just too small of a sample size, honestly. Uh, I, I figured that would be the case too. But um, now that you pointed that out, I feel like, cause I, I have my KPIs in the variance section set to a 0.5% response rate and Texas came out higher than that. So I'm, I'm probably actually running like a 0.6% on just Texas, but Georgia was garbage. So that's what's drawing down the rest of them. Um, but in Idaho, I just mailed like another, it was like a quick, I knew I was probably going to get grilled and <laughs> on, on Idaho and sure enough, uh, all the all the responses are just vicious. So and, um, uh, it was a really nice area in in uh, Idaho with um, uh, what's it called? Pretty close to the Teton Mountains, and oh, it's yeah. just it's a hot area. It's a hot area, and I just got roasted on that one. So it's uh, it's a small batch, and I knew that might be a chance. But hey, shoot your shot, you know. So it's yeah. like it wasn't too big of a deal. But I was, and that's probably also going to bring me. I got two responses, both were not friendly. And um, out of like a thousand mailers almost. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. You never know. Because I mean, I do I do keep this in the back of my head. Because last year, almost almost half of my deals came in months. And I'm talking months after I spent I sent the mail. Um, I, so I think slow, dude. so it slow. Is. It's so it slower than anyone realizes. And that's why like people get their panties in a lot of the 60 days in. And I'm like, I understand where you're coming from. But also... It just takes way longer than you expect. <laughs> like, yeah, it really does. And we're talking about you know thin. It's a it's a thin line we walk because one deal can make a mailer wildly profitable. And so sometimes True. yeah, you sent three thousand mailers and you only got one deal, and that feels kind of a, you know, deflating. And maybe you only got three leads, but you made forty grand. So it's like you know, on paper it still works. And I think too like even if you're doing the scrubbing and doing all the things right, I'm sure you still suffer this. Sometimes we just have campaigns that just flop. But when yep. we zoom out and we look at the totals at the end of the year, like it, the cards stack in our favor. But campaign to campaign, it, it does range. And that's what last um, year I had, I had a three thousand go to North Carolina that completely flopped, and I still across the yeah. board yielded a 0.6 percent response rate. So like yeah. once someone pointed that out, I was like, 
let me go look back. And I was like, oh, yeah, huh? Like, no, I had that one. It was complete garbage, just like this one that went to Georgia was. And yeah. It doesn't matter. Like, it just doesn't. So yeah. There's no, no way I've been I found to be able to mitigate that. It just kind of happens. Um, yep. Dude, to wrap up here, if you were to give one piece of sage Anthony wisdom to a new land investor, let's say they're watching this right now, what, what's your one piece of advice? If you're starting on a budget, prioritize not spending. <laughs> Get what you need. Start with what you need. A lot of other things can come later on. Get your first deal through the door. Simple as that. It will fuel itself. Um, yep. If you're starting keyword, if you're starting on a budget, if you're throwing, but I feel like it's better to start on a budget and start with a limited quantity because you'll make it more efficient. You'll learn how to make it more efficient. Um, often there's plenty of problems that come from people starting with too much money and they burn too quickly. And, um, more problems can come from that than the other way around actually. So um, a limited quantity and limited budget will be almost in your best interest to make you make sure you approach it from a perspective of efficiency. And if you're just starting out, uh, you're going to have every doubt that could possibly throw flow through your head, flow through your head. Give yourself one year. Do not look back and just head down to nose to the grindstone, regardless of what the results are looking like in any small window of time. And don't just don't look back. And after a year, I would maybe reassess my situation or but until then, you're going to doubt you're going to it's, it's going to happen. So that's why when you're saying people are freaking out after the first six, I'm like, for like uh, 60 days. And I was like, Oh, I know that feeling. <laughs> I know that feeling where it's like, here we are. And we're in the thick of it. You're watching money exit your bank account. Nothing's come back in yet, but it's the startup phase. Get comfortable. You're going to be here for a little bit. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess that's good. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, that, that was it. I was like, that's pretty much the majority of it right there. I was, I was looking at a hammer at home, man. I think that's all great advice. And I think we deal with a lot of first time entrepreneurs in this business. I have a lot of empathy for folks that haven't walked this path before and they kind of jarring at first, but at the same time, you're starting a business. Most businesses don't even break even until years in. Like yeah. I, I see folks that have this expectation that they're going to be 90 days in and just rolling in it and living off their business. And that's kind of goes in the same vein. Like you can start with a budget and I do think it makes you a little more agile, but also if you start with a budget, don't assume that this business is all of a sudden going to pay your bills. Like you got to make sure yeah. you have your head above water to give this thing time, it's a business. There's no strategy, guru, teacher, software tool, anything that can take the time out of this. Like, there is just a time component. And I think people do lose sight of that. It's their first mailer and it didn't work. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that, that happens. <laughs> Someone starts a, a new business and they put ads on Facebook and they don't get any customers. And they say, oh my God, I got to learn and I iterate and I improve. And it just kind of comes to the territory. But totally. the cards are really stacked in our favor. What business can you start and in a year pretty much change your life? I mean, I'm sure on some level, this has been life-changing will continue to be life-changing. So we're also really fortunate. I always tell people yep. like, this is, this is like the junior version of entrepreneurship for most people. Like yep. it's very laid out for you. It's very systematic. There's not a lot of unknowns, but you will have that, that entrepreneurial discomfort. So anyways, brother, I always appreciate it. I appreciate you making the time. It's always fun just chatting to folks that are absolutely in this business and excited in this business. I always kind of pick up on people's excitement. Not that I've lost my excitement, but I've just been in it for, for so long. You yeah. start to kind of get jaded a little bit. So it's always fun, man. Um, anyways, we'll wrap it up here. Um, Anthony, if people want to connect with you or partner on a deal or, or fund your deals or whatever. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, Discord's probably best. Um, just Anthony Ray Reese on Discord um, or email. Email's fine as well. Uh, Atlaslandexchange at gmail.com. And yes, I do need to get an actual business uh, email, yeah, but that, yeah, clearly that shit doesn't matter because here we are. Like yeah. quite a few. No, it's true. It doesn't matter. Yep. I think it helps a little bit, but it really it's not a needle mover. All yep. right, guys. Thanks for everyone for watching. We'll see you guys in the next video. I guess. See you guys. Bye.